I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. What was their righteousness? It was the righteousness that a dedicated mind and, and a consecrated intellect could produce without the Holy Spirit. They fasted, they tithed, they prayed, they abstained from eating meat, they observed holy days, they memorized scripture, they were enthusiastic in talking about their religion, and all of these things can be done without the Holy Ghost. All of this can be done. You can be orthodox in your theology, and you can be evangelistic in your zeal, you can be missionary in your fervor, you can be devout in your pra practice, you can fast, you can tithe, you can pray, you can do all of these things, and do it with the natural energy with which previously you served the devil. And so the Lord Jesus Christ said, the righteousness which prepares you for heaven is not, is not that which you produce by your energy, but it is that which is produced in you by another source entirely. It is that righteousness which is from above. It is the work of God in you. And so this is something he has to say about salvation. When we read in Hebrews 1, 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? No one can say, well, thank God, my sins are pardoned. I haven't neglected salvation. The word here used includes everything that God in grace has done for his people through the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the warning given in this third verse is not respecting pardon from past sins. It is neglecting anything that the Lord Jesus provided for his people. And thus deals with that heart of indolence that says, well, I'd like this from the Lord, but really I'm not the least interested in any more. Utterly cutting across this attitude that says, well, I'd like to take uh, certain things from the sacrifice of Christ, but you see, really, I just don't want to go all the way. I, I'm not interested in some of these other things. The word in the first verse is equally explicit. We ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Why? Because there's a tendency to allow precious things to slip through our hands. Becoming concerned about other things and interested in tasks which are more appealing to us. Truth, which was in the eternal mind and heart of God, and purchased at the tremendous price of the blood of Christ, just slips through our fingers and slides away with the common cares of the day. And so we have a warning here. We ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest in our preoccupation with many things, this truth, just like sand in our hands, slip through, slide away, and we be left with nothing but regrets. Again, we see it here. How shall we escape if we neglect? It isn't refusal. It isn't rejection. It isn't a matter of taking one stand against. It's just a little matter of saying, well, another day, another time. There are other things more important, other things more challenging, other things more demanding of my time and thought. And the question isn't whether or not we will neglect it. The question is this. What are we going to do? How are we going to explain it? How are we going to face him who purchased these priceless privileges with his precious blood, included them in his word, and had them expounded to our hearts, and then we, in our indolence and in our carelessness, were prepared to just neglect the things which God purchased by the poured out blood of his only begotten Son. How are we going to escape it? How are we going to escape it? This is the question. Well, what are the consequences? You understand, of course, that if a person neglects repentance, neglects faith in Jesus Christ, that they'll be forever in hell. This is the tragedy of neglect. Just this is, the, this is the crime of neglect in respect to the matter of past sins and the matter of the pardon and justifying love of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we recognize that this is fatal in its consequence. And I'm sure that there are few here that would challenge that tonight. But then there's another thing that comes along. We somehow have gotten the idea, you know, 
that whereas it is of tremendous importance that we should acknowledge Jesus Christ as Savior, and we should accept the salvation that he died to provide, it isn't nearly as important to take the other things that were included in his death. And so we find that there's a matter of option there. I think it grows out of our misuse of the word saved. I think we have failed to understand that that word was never intended to be used as we customarily use it. And I think because we have misused it, we've misled a lot of people into thinking that the only thing God is interested in is sort of getting them signed up for a, a, to occupy a room in the mansion he's building in eternity. John said to his generation, Repent, because repentance is the means whereby the barrier between you and God is removed, and the end of God's grace is to bring you into fellowship with God, not simply to take you to heaven. Now, here's a misconception that carries along with what we've been discussing. Too many people have felt that God's, God's great purpose in grace was to take us to heaven when we die. Oh, how many things can grow out of a, a, the wrong emphasis. God's great purpose in grace is not just to take us to heaven when we die. It is to save us from sin. It is to make us like Jesus Christ. It is to bring us into vital, living, warm, experiential fellowship with him now during the days of our pilgrimage. And then because he's already brought heaven to us, it will be a simple matter for him to take us to heaven. But heaven was to begin in our hearts. Now I'll say another thing that I think you'll agree with. And that is that if God were to take you to heaven, send you to heaven rather, and wouldn't come himself, give you a mansion, give you a house right down in the main street of glory, right next to the river of life, and even give you the franchise to take up the paving in front, the gold paving, and sell it to the rest of the inhabitants, God still would have doomed you to hell if he didn't come there. Because I assure you that heaven cannot consist in a mansion. It can't consist in any of the things which are generally associated with a heavenly abode. The thing that makes heaven heavenly is not the mansion, not the street of gold, not the river of life, and not the hearts in which the angels will play. The thing that makes heaven heavenly is the revelation of God, without restriction or inhibition or anything to obscure him. And if he were to send you to however blissful a situation you can imagine and not come himself, he would have simply relocated hell and renamed it. For that which your heart demands is not a place and not things and not a situation. Oh, this is a most sensual concept. This is a most materialistic concept. What we are seeing is that heaven is a place, but that which makes the place heavenly is the presence of the king of the place, the Lord of the place, the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, God's purpose in grace isn't just to give us a ticket to a place, but our, His purpose is to bring that, the atmosphere and the government and the blessing of that place to our hearts by bringing the person who will make the place heavenly to our hearts. Now, if this is the case, then we'll understand that everything that the Lord Jesus provided is important. Everything that was included in His cross work was important. And you can't sit back and say, well, I'm justified, I'm pardoned, I'm forgiven. That is salvation. And I have that. And I have what he came to bring. And I know he's left a few little heights for people to scale one way and another. But as far as I'm concerned, I have the important thing. What is important? Everything is important. Everything he intended. Everything he provided. Everything that was procured by the shedding of his blood. And therefore, how are we going to escape if we neglect anything that God intended to be ours? Thus, there ought to come into every heart an avid hunger to have all that the Lord Jesus died to make ours, to be all that he intended to us to be, and to experience everything that was ours. Let me give you an illustration. Suppose, dear heart, you could be justified and born again and have an attitude of complete indifference to the things of God, and you get home to heaven. And the first thing the Lord does is say, Come with me, child. And he takes you out to the warehouse of his grace. He throws back the big double doors, and there are the deep shells lined with things which he purchased with his blood, signed, sealed, packaged, and addressed to you in the various stages of your pilgrimage. Here, here was health when you were sick. Here was victory when you were tempted. 
Here was the power of the Holy Spirit when you were entrusted with tasks. And as he begins to just point these things out and take the promises that he put in his book and says, why didn't you take this? Why didn't you claim this? Here I made provision for you. And then he gives you a flashback of your life. And you see how that you went along broken, went along defeated, went along creeping when you could have run, when you could have mount up with wings as eagles, you prowled as a worm in the dust. And he says, see what your life was? And then he gives you a preview of what your life could have been. And there is the, the cupboard filled with the blessings that he provided with his own blood. Purchased for you. And you were too indifferent and callous to even want to claim. How are you going to escape the heartache and the grief that comes from realizing you have robbed the Lord Jesus of the glory he could have gotten out of your life? If you cared about the provisions of his blood. Stubborn, hard-hearted, indifferent, preoccupied satisfied with a crumb and you could have had a loaf. And all the time you've been dishonoring him because you've been less than he provided, less than he expected. And so it is that when the children of God spurn the provisions of God's grace and neglect that which he has given, they are actually shaming their heavenly father. They're dishonoring him because here were provisions of love that is in his infinite wisdom he knew his people needed in order that being strengthened and helped and encouraged and delivered, they could walk in the presence of a skeptical world and by their walk and their attitude and demeanor and expression and their victory and their joy and their peace, they could honor their Father. What are you going to do about it, dear child of God, if and when you get home to heaven, you discover that though you've made it by the skin of your teeth, yet every step of the way you've dishonored the Father that loves you and whom you profess to love by simply neglecting the provisions of his love and the provisions of his grace.